Good morning, church. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. After a few weeks, we've been doing um, home um, home service and home worshiping as well. This time, we are back at the church, uh, and hopefully, next time we meet, maybe not soon, but next time, sometime soon, then we'll be meeting face to face and praising God this morning. Now, before we start, let's bow our head in prayer and and, and submit our worship this morning to the Lord. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this morning, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love for us and your grace and your mercy that overwhelm our life, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for being a great Father to us, protecting our life, Lord, and keeping us safe and healthy, Father, in the midst of the sickness that goes around and this pandemic that goes around, Father, that we are still healthy in your presence. We can still praise your name and glorify your name, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Father, for this morning, Lord. We just want to send our, our service this morning into your hand. Lord, fill our heart with your presence, Father, with your love, with your mercy, and your grace, Father. And let each of it, every one of us, Lord, experience your love this morning, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. May you are magnifying this place this morning. In His name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to start, um, a kick off this morning with the uh, power in the blood of the Lamb, knowing that His blood that runs through us gives us the power to face any possibility in life. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There is wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Good morning and welcome to Gateway Community Church and our Sunday worship today here online from Bali, Indonesia. It's great to have you with us. Um, it's a pity we can't see you in person. It's a pity you can't see us in person, but this is the way we're going. Um, we, you may have been following the Facebook devotions through the week. We've been doing Monday, Wednesday, Monday Tuesday, Wednesdays. Uh, most weeks, and as we're looking forward, we're thinking about, okay, 
what are we going to talk about, what are we going to discuss, and if, if there are questions you guys are thinking, how do I deal with this, how, do, how, what, how shall I understand this in scripture or in my life or anything like that, please send your questions in, Pastor Wade is uh, sitting on the edge of his seat waiting for your questions to direct our Facebook devotions. Um, we have the prayer line is ongoing. We have a team of people praying. Um, keep on using it. This is a resource. We need all the prayer we can get uh, at this time. So you can see the number on the screen. Um, please send in your WhatsApp message and we will pray for you. Uh, you also may remember, I hope you didn't forget, we're seven days in, you know, 20 days of praise. Um, so every morning, when you wake up in the morning, praise God. Uh, we, will, we also want to say thank you for the gi your giving. Um, I'm not going to say much about it apart from thank you right now. We, we've been having money into our general fund, which helps us to administer the um, what it takes to make the church work. Um, and we've also been receiving money in our outreach funds, and that money we are using to reach out to people in need of basic foodstuffs. Uh, we will give you more of an update next week. Um, that's it from me. Our reading this morning is taken from Psalm 100, verses 1 to 5, the NIV version. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Hi, good morning everyone and welcome once again to our Sunday morning service online. We are back in our famous Gateway Studios, if you haven't noticed, with our Great team, Simon and Chris, who are just crazy, and uh, we're just making a lot of jokes, but you don't hear them, so it's probably better. <clears throat> so my prayer over this whole time has been that you and I, that we have experienced or are experiencing spiritual and personal growth with the Lord, that the Spirit of God would be moving in us and the Word of God would be changing us and working in us. Now, we're asking that God's doing some powerful things in our hearts and not, I know we're also asking that he's doing things in our circumstances, but we also want God to do things in our hearts and to draw us closer to him, to, to help us to become more intimate with him, to, to be more excited about life with God. And so hopefully over this time, we're not just getting weaker and draining and draining, but we're energizing with the spirit and the word of God. Um, this series that we have been dealing with for the last several weeks is uh, we're looking at plugging into God as the power source. And we're plugging into him. He's the power source, not us. We feel the drain. But God's the power source. And we're looking into plugging into him through one prayer and through two praise and today through his word, his promises. And we get the power from God that Great things happen when we pray, when we praise, and we're, when we're in his word. So prayer, praise, and promises. It's like the trifecta, uh, the, the triple crown, or the hat trick, if you will, if you're a soccer or football player. So we started this series with talking about how powerful God is. He's the creator, right? And we said at the beginnings that he even, he just spoke the word and things came into existence, right? And we read the Genesis story. We read the creation in Genesis chapter 1, how God spoke and created. 
It didn't create something out of something else. That's what you and I do. He created something out of nothing. He spoke and matter came to being. He spoke and that matter became other things. And God speaks in this power in his words. And these are beautiful things. And it sounds crazy to us because we don't have, you know, we're created beings also. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, the writer of Hebrews says this, it is by faith that we understand that the universe was created by God's word. So that things that are seen were made of things that are not seen. By faith, we take that step and we believe that God created everything through the power of his word. So God created it. And then Hebrews 1.3, he says this, the Son, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Then it says this, sustaining all things by the power of his word. Not only did God create it, but he sustains it, he maintains it, he upholds it, he keeps it going, he keeps it together. The Apostle Paul, he He reflects on this also in his letter to the Colossians. In chapter 1, he writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Listen, for in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, things that are visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or powers or or or, uh, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's amazing, right? That's how powerful God is. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So here we also see that God creates everything, and he binds it together. He holds it together. He keeps it working by the power of his word. That's some powerful words, right? Have all creation exist today because of such? But this also includes us, you and I, our very existence. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, it says, In him, in Christ, we live and move and have our being. Our very existence is in God. Everything is held together by his, whole, by his word. The whole universe is held together moment to moment by his word. Imagine if God just stopped holding things together. Every atom would just, you know, in the atom, in the nucleus of the atom, there's this, uh, it's called, there's just a couple of protons. And protons, because uh, they should just be repelling each other, but they call it this, the strong force. And it's what keeps these two protons together in the nucleus, and it's amazing. And God, he sustains and he, he holds creation together. And imagine if, that, if God just said, not, stop, enough. Imagine the chain reaction of every atom in every molecule and every uh, piece of matter that just reacted and exploded because he wasn't holding it together anymore. For some reason, we think, you and I, that we are self-sufficient, that we can be independent of God, where our very breath, our very life, our very existence is held together by his word. You know, uh, you were thinking about helicopters, right? Because I've been thinking about helicopters. (laughs) You think about a helicopter, the complex mechanics of a helicopter. There's a small uh, piece of metal, a small nut at the top of the rotor, and This nut holds all the rotor together, it holds the the blades together, and it holds it all to the mast. He says, and if this nut were to ever come off, that one piece piece were to ever come off, the whole thing would just fall apart and the, the helicopter would crash to the ground. Do you know what that nut is called? It is called the Jesus nut. (laughs) <laughs> Crazy, <laughs> right? The pilots of, of uh, the helicopter pilots in Vietnam nicknamed it the Jesus nut because it's one piece that holds everything together. And if that one piece cracks, fails, uh, breaks, then the whole thing's going down. And when it's going down, this is what they say: your last words, pray to Jesus. That's the Jesus nut. 
If the word of God's power can uphold, can sustain, can maintain the universe moment by moment, then can't he uphold you? Can't his word uphold you? His word can uphold us through our situation. It can uphold us through our, our trauma. It can uphold us through our marriage. It can uphold us through uh, work, uh, college, schooling, relationships, whatever it is, whatever trial we're going through. If God's word can sustain the universe, it can sustain you. It can even sustain your children. Trust the Lord for your children. Do, we, do you as parents trust God for your children? Beneath his watchful eye, his saints securely dwell. That hand which holds all nature up will guard his children well. Have you ever made a promise that you didn't keep? Has anyone ever made a promise to you that they didn't keep? You know how it is when you're a child or if you have children and you say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to get ice cream later. I promise. You promise? Yes, I promise. And then, of course, you forget or maybe you hope they forget. And by the time you get home, I thought you promised. Or I tell my wife she wants me to fix something or do something. I say, I'll, get it to, I'll do it tomorrow. I promise. I'll do it tomorrow. Honey, I swear I'll do it tomorrow. Hmm. Right? Even from insignificant things or unimportant things to very important things, we often break our promise. Right? How about it? certainly 50% of marriages that are ending in divorce say, I promise to love you till death do us part, but we don't keep that love all the time till the end. We have a habit of breaking promises as humans. Have you ever made a promise that you could not keep? keep? You knew you had no intention of keeping that promise, or you, 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 know, you, you knew there was no way you could keep that promise? You know, when we watch, my wife and I watch TV, we'll see these, this movie or TV show, and there'll be somebody, and they're, they're under 800 kilograms of concrete, and they've got an arm over there and a leg over there. They've got bullet holes in them, and they've got cobras biting their heads, right? And their friend says, I'll save you. Yeah, you're not going to die. I promise. Right? Yeah, sure. My wife, who never, never talks during a movie, will look at that TV and say, you can't make that promise. You can't say that. Right? Because we know we can't make certain promises. Could you imagine if God was frivolous or careless with his word? If he made promises that he knew he wasn't going to keep? If he said and declared things and was like, well, maybe, just believe it. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it. We'll see. God doesn't, he's not careless with his words. He's not careless with his promises. When he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, is that mm, maybe? No, it's a promise from God. He will never leave you or forsake you. If you seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first, he says, I'll add all these other things to you. That's a promise that you and I can believe. He says, we cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. I will take care of your cares. Is that just a crazy promise from a crazy God? Like, yeah, I don't think so. God is not careless with his promises. Joshua uh, when he, at the end of the book, when he had led Israel through a campaign to take Canaan, he said this in chapter 21, verse 45, he says, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Every one of them was fulfilled. Every time God made a promise, it's sure. Nehemiah said, you have kept your promise because you are righteous. Not only does God have the power to back up his promises, but his very character mandates that he fulfill his promises. So now that we see that God's word is powerful and God confirms his, his promises by his righteousness, Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God, God's word, it is alive 
and powerful. Alive and powerful. And you might say, well, I don't see that power in my life. Or how can I see that power in my life? How is God's word alive and powerful in me? Well, there's countless ways. I'm just going to talk real quick about three broad ways that we see the power of God in our lives. Number one, God's power to heal. His power to heal. Jesus spoke and things happened. I mean, we pray things happen. We, we praise and things happen because we're, we're going to God. Jesus himself spoke and things happened. Powerful things, big things, miraculous things happened. He spoke and the evil spirits immediately left the, demo, the demonized man. He spoke and the storm was calm. He spoke and disease was gone. He spoke and sickness was gone. Blindness was gone. Pain was gone. Suffering was gone at the mere words of the Savior. He spoke and a dead man came back to life like that. God's word, powerful. God's word can heal. God's word forgives sin like that. We heard him throughout the gospel saying, your sins are forgiven. And when your sins are forgiven, your guilt is gone and your shame is gone. Gone. But why, why do we feel guilt and shame afterwards? Because we don't believe truly that God, the power of his words, that he has forgiven us. But he does. And it is, mo it is instantaneous. <clears throat> Psalm 107 says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distresses. He sent his word and healed them. He sent out his word and it healed them. The power of God's word just from his mouth to heal. It can take care of any problem, any physical problem, any melt, uh, mental, emotional any relational problem, any chemical problem that we have, God's word can heal. Why doesn't he? Why doesn't he do it more often? When Jesus, he said, the Bible says he went around healing many, but there was also ones he did not heal. We don't know always why God doesn't, chooses not to heal everybody. But it's not just the physical that God heals. He heals the heart. Number two, the power to transform. The power to transform our lives, our hearts, our thinking, our, our, our understanding. The power to transform from, from darkness to light. From lost to saved. Read with me, 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, his divine power. His power right? He's the power source. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our understanding or knowledge of him. Everything that we need for a godly life is given through his power, through his word, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Listen to this. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. These very great, it's a superlative. It's the greatest, the greatest of all promises. Right? They are precious. They are, uh, are honorable. The greatest of all promises by God are given to you and I. And we have access to them. And they are powerful for us. How? To help us participate in God's divine nature. Because in my nature, I'm not forgiving. In my nature, I'm not kind. In my nature, I'm not happy. In my nature, I'm not generous. But when I accept, when I, uh, I accept the, the promises of God, it transforms who I am into his likeness. It's transforming power. Somebody told my wife the other day, they said, you know, people, I used to be so negative, and now people are like, what happened to you? You're so, you're so positive. You're so kind and positive. What's going on? The power of God through his word to transform. We plug into the power source through his promises. 
right? We plug into God through his promises, and we are changed from the inside out with transformation. With transformation comes freedom. With transformation comes freedom. Freedom is a change. John 8, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, look, if you're holding on to my teachings, you're taking them in, you're not just listening to them, but you're using them, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We will know the truth when we know his teachings and that truth, it will set us free. It'll set our hearts free, our minds free, our attitudes free. It'll set our our desires free from lust to godliness. You know, Clarence Hall uh, was a war correspondent in 1945, and he was on the island of Okinawa in Japan. And he went to a village, and him and his driver got to the village. It's called uh, Shimabuku. And here, he was met by two men, uh, Nakamura, the mayor, and Kina, the schoolmaster. And instead of uh, greeting the Americans with fear or trembling or with weapons, it said they greeted them with a bow and a smile and, and, and welcomed them into the village. And these, these two guys, they looked around the village and they thought, wow, this is so beautiful. It's so clean and neat and, and organized and peaceful. Not like the other villages that we have gone through. He says, and then uh, he sat down and he got the story from them. The story was, is that 30 years before, an American missionary was coming through Okinawa to Japan. And he stopped in that village long enough, and he led those two gentlemen to the Lord. And he gave them a Bible in Japanese, and he said, here's, you know, here's a couple of hymns, here's a Bible, and live unto God, because it's good for you and your people. So, uh, <laughs> so 30 years later, as they have read the word of God, The Ten Commandments became the legal code for the village. The Sermon on the Mount became the moral code for the village, the guide to to social conduct. The Bible became the main literature in the school. The kids were reading the Bible every day, memorizing scripture. The result was, is that for decades, this village had no jail, didn't need a jail, had no uh, brothels, had no drunkenness, had no divorce, uh, and it was very high in health and happiness. And he was just amazed. And the driver said to Clarence, he said, so this is what comes out of only a Bible and a couple of old guys that want to live like Jesus. That's all it takes. His word and a desire to live like Jesus. And the whole village was changed for decades. The people had changed. The whole attitude of everything changed. Transformation. The Bible, God's word, his written word, his spoken word, it brings transformation to our heart. Number three, the power for battle. The power for battle. You and I, often we get up in the morning and we think, wow, it's another battle, another day, more problems, another issue. This thing hasn't gone away. Another attack, another temptation. Whatever it might be that we're going to face in that day, the word of God is our weapon. Could you imagine sending troops into war with no weapons at all? Nothing? It wouldn't make any sense. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the Bible says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. This is our weapon. This is our sword to battle the details of life for the day. This is our weapon to battle temptation. Lots of people leave that last part out and they said, the sword of the spirit and the spirit will lead me and guide me and it's all spirit. It is the word of God. The spirit speaks through his word. How can the spirit fight the battle in your mind? Because our mind is the biggest battlefield that we face. And how can the spirit of God fight the battle in your mind? It's with God's word. 
We need God's word in our hearts and in our minds so that the spirit can use it as a weapon against those thoughts we have, those thoughts of suicide, those thoughts of depression, those thoughts of I'm going to leave my family, those thoughts of there's nothing left for me, the thoughts of I'm, I'm nothing, the, all, the thoughts of depre- uh, um, um, emptiness and loneliness. God's word, his spirit uses his word that's hidden in our hearts to battle those thoughts. It also battles against temptation, the temptation that comes from without and the temptation and sin that comes from within. And God's word is a a weapon against it so that we don't succumb to that and then fall flat on our face in uh, hopelessness because of sin. Remember in Matthew chapter 4, what did Jesus do when he was faced with temptation? He used the word of God. Every time Satan tempted him, He used the word of God to combat it, right? Didn't need a big fight, didn't need anything, just, hey, one verse, one verse, that's all I needed to fight that temptation, right? If Jesus was tempted, well, I think you and I get tempted, right? Don't get condemned for being tempted, but pull out your sword and fight it. Don't give in to it. So we have the power of God's word to heal, to transform, and to fight. But how do I plug into that power? It's there. It's there for the using. It's there for the taking. How do I plug into it? Two things as we close. Receive it and believe it. Right? We have to be an active participant here. Receive it means we have to read it and listen to it. Read God's word. Read God's word. Listen to it. Listen to it. There's a couple ways to listen. Listen when you're reading because you're listening to yourself as you read in your heart or out loud. And you also listen to it through a sermon today or other sermons that you listen to or conversations with friends. It's listening, reading and listening. And number two, believing. Not just saying, not just acknowledging, but believing. Putting it, and when we believe in something, we put it into practice. We follow it. We do it. We do what it says. Let's look at this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word, Paul is telling them, you received the word of God, which you heard from us. So you heard it, you received it, you accepted it, Not as just human word. Now, these aren't just my words, but this is God's word. And indeed, it worked in you who believed. They received it. They believed it. And as a result, it worked in them. Right? We can't just leave it on the table and go, well, okay, there's God's word. It's like like if you had a, uh, if you went to the doctor and he gave you a, you know, pills in a bottle and he gave it to you and you took it home because you got to get rid of this pain or, or infection or whatever and you put it there and you're just looking at the bottle and you're going, all right, go ahead, do your thing. Often we just leave the Bible right there and say, okay, God's word's powerful, do your thing, go ahead. As if it's just going to osmosis around us and change. Wow. No, when you get those pills, you got to read the directions. I got to take two a day, three times a day, da, 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 and then you got to do it. You got to read it and you got to do it, right? God's word. You want it to be effective in your life? You got to read it, you got to hear it, and then you got to put it into practice. You got to believe it enough to put it into practice. Hebrews 11, the writer of Hebrews says that faith comes by hearing right? No, he doesn't. Actually, he says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And how do we get faith? Well, that's Romans. And Romans says, is, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We need faith to please God. And how do we get that faith? We hear his word. So he, he gives us his word to hear so that we have the faith to please him. It's all a gift from God. When we have faith, we have hope. When we have faith, we have confidence. When we have faith, we have God's power. And God's power transforms. God's power heals. God's power battles for us. And God's power sets us free. 
James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 says this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Right? We listen to the word and we think, well, that's it. I listened. How come it's not working? I listened. I'm a good, I'm a good Christian. I, I went to church and listened. He said, don't just listen because that's listening in itself. That's passive faith. I'm just a listener. But an active faith is when he says, do what it says. Passive faith, just listening. Active faith, listening and implementing. Listening and obeying. Listening and doing it. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and then after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. If I had a magic mirror and you could look in the mirror, look at yourself, and you could tap that mirror anywhere on your body and fix whatever you wanted to fix. You see, the mirror is showing you the blemishes, so you tap that pimple and it's gone. You tap that, smooth that wrinkle and they're gone. Right? You, you do that tummy tuck, sit right there, it's gone. Right? You add a little muscle, go, done. Right? How much you, would you pay for a mirror like that? Priceless. <laughs> right? This is the word of God. The word of God is a mirror, and it shows us, well, it says, oh, wait a minute, look at that. Yeah. And then it gives us the power to change, and it changes us. Right? It says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the word of God, that gives us freedom, and it continues in it, not forgetting what they heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. There's a promise there. If we believe it, we receive it, we believe it, we put it into practice, we will be blessed in all we do. Man, that's a beautiful promise. So God... His word is powerful. His word is true. It's backed up by his character, his trustworthiness, his righteousness. Everything that God is, is for you. Everything God created was for him, through him. He holds it all together. And that creation and our very existence is dependent on God moment by moment. And the very power of his word has come into the world so that we can be healed, we can be transformed, we can be set free, and we can battle the details and cares of this life that we have to face while we live in a a fallen world. God's power through his word is there. So what do we do with it? We receive it. We receive it. How How can I battle with God's word if I don't have it inside? If I don't know what it is? How can I be transformed by his word if I don't listen to it and let it transform me? Oh, you and I, this is why on our email we have this little Bible reading thing. Just download a Bible reading plan. You don't have to do it in a year. There's no, there's no law in scripture that says you must read the whole Bible in one year. Take your time, read through it, chew on it, love it, enjoy it, draw power from it, be healed by it, be transformed by it. John 6, 63 says this, Jesus says, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. You know, Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to to give us life. And you and I can experience the power of his life through prayer, through praise, and through his promises. Amen? Amen. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, for your very powerful, your great and precious promises. God, we thank you that you back up your word with everything that you are. We thank you that you love us. You care for us. You died for us. We thank you. In Jesus' name, bless us as we read your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.
<clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Wade, for the encouraging word this morning, reminding us that we are strong because we are standing on his promises, the promises of God right, to, to the word that we listen every day of our life. This morning, as a closing, we're going to remind ourselves again through the song, Standing on the Promises of Christ, My King, just to remind us that we are strong in him by the word of God that lives in our life. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Because we are standing on his promise of God.